questions, let me continue. Uh, are you seeing the screen? No, no, you're not. Okay. Share computer sound. There we go. Now are you seeing the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, I think we're going to finish chapter eight today and uh, have a little bit of review for quiz two. Any questions about what we're doing? All right, I think I just introduced the topic of transduction, transduction, but I didn't actually get discussing any of it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. So transduction uses a virus to move around DNA in a cell. And we will talk about bacterial viruses in a little bit, that might be two lessons from now. It's not the next lesson. Um, so we haven't talked about viruses yet, but when bacteria viruses infect a cell, they'll bind to the cell and then inject their DNA into the cell. And then they'll use the cell to replicate their DNA. And one of the first things the bacterial genome does is it codes for an enzyme that degrades the bacterial DNA. And why the viral genome wants to do that is if you degrade the host chromosome, then your genome is calling the shots in the cell. The host genome is not calling the shots. Okay? And then the uh, viral DNA replicates and it's transcribed to make viral proteins and that makes new viruses and you put the uh, viral DNA into the head of the uh, protein and then you have the new virus. Any question about any of that? And then viruses, at least a lytic virus, will lyse the cell to release the new virions. And that happens in transduction. Let me see if I can blow this up a little. Yeah, I can, good. Uh, viruses, because they make so many offspring, they're not worried if a mistake gets made because they make lots of offspring. Any question about that? All right, so sometimes the virus grabs the replicated viral DNA and puts it into the virus. And these are all of those viruses with the red genome. But you notice that virus, it has a purple genome. The purple is a piece of the DNA to the host chromosome. And it grabbed some DNA and stuck it into the virus, and it just made a mistake. But that's okay because lots of viruses were replicated, and there's only one, or in this case two, that are made mis by mistake. In reality, it, it's not this often, okay? It might be one cell in all of them, and there will be 50 to 300 viruses in this cell. What happens now when this virus infects a cell? It does the same thing. It binds to this cell, injects its DNA into the cell, but this DNA is not viral DNA. It is DNA from a part of the chromosome of this host cell. Do you guys see that? And then that DNA can recombine to the recipient cell's DNA. And then this 
recipient cell can express new genes, a gene that came from this cell. And that's how viruses can move around DNA from this cell to that cell. Any question about that? Can this happen in the human population? It's either yes or no. Yes. Uh, yes, it probably happens in our nose cells all the time. However, who cares? Because your nose cells aren't germline cells, so it's not going to be a part of the human genome. Okay? So, as far as this happening to the germline, it almost never happens in the human genome that way. But in bacteria, it happens all the time. And like I said, this cell can get uh, a gene for bacterial resistance from that cell, making this cell then resistant to antibiotics. Any question about that? And that happens <clears throat> about 1 in 10 to the 5 times, 10 times more frequently than spontaneous mutation. So that is how three methods of horizontal gene transfer can spread around pre-existing genetic information in the population by transformation, conjugation, and transduction. And so a cell can get a gene that pre-exists in the population by one of these three means, and that cell would get it more frequently from either transformation con tra conjunction or transduction than it would from spontaneous mutation. And this happens in bacteria cells all the time, all three of them. Okay? Any question about any of that? But these only spread around pre-existing genetic information, meaning that the gene has to exist someplace in the world, someplace in the population or a neighboring population, I guess. Something like that. If the gene doesn't exist anywhere, it has to be created by spontaneous mutation or by a mutagen by mutation. Any question about any of that? All right. So we talked about uh, uh, most genes in bacteria are on their chromosome, but some genes can be on a small piece of DNA that's extra chromosomal and we call it a plasmid. It is circular. There's no histone proteins on it. So in a way, it's the same as a chromosome, except the chromosome has thousands of genes on it in bacteria. The plasmid only has a few genes on it. Why plasmids are important is not really that they replicate independently from the cell's chromosome, is that if a gene is on a plasmid, it's much more likely to spread, that gene is much more likely to spread in a population of cells. Any question about that? So the genes can be on a chromosome in the cell, but they can be on a plasmid. And we'll actually learn later in the term they could be on a virus in the cell as well. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. There are different types of plasmid. That's all I want you to know. I don't want you to know the different names of the different type of plasmids. But there are different types of plasmids. All right, any question about plasmids? If not, let's move on to something that's similar to plasmids, but different, and that's a transposon. 
also called a jumping gene. And transposons are regions of DNA, meaning a part of DNA, but they don't stay in one place. They can move to another part of the DNA. And that's why they're called jumping genes. Uh, plasmids, let me blow that up a little bit. Plasmids uh, usually encode something, like they always have to have at least the transposase gene. I'll talk about that in a minute. And they have an inverted repeat. The inverted repeat helps this gene jump out and then insert itself in another location. Uh, the transposase is extremely important too because it is an enzyme and it cuts the DNA right here and right here. And then, then this DNA inserts itself into another region of DNA. The transposase gene cuts the DNA so this DNA can fit in where the cut was. Okay? We call these inverted repeats an insertion sequence as well as the transposase gene. And that is the simple transposon. But all it is coding for really is the transposon. Okay? It has transposase and an inverted repeat. But you can have a complex transposon that has a transposon, and usually they have two transposons, one in one end and another on another end. And then they have another gene in between. So that's a complex transposon. They carry other genes with them when they move around from place to place in the genome. My mouse has died. There we go. And transposons are important because they can move the gene, like anamycin resistance, into a plasmid. And then the plasmid can move into another cell, like through conjugation. Okay, so that's why transposons are important. They can move genetic information around from one region of the DNA to another, and from one region of the cell to another, making it more likely for this gene, like anamycin resistance, to spread in the population. Like this canamycin resistant gene moved from the chromosome into a plasmid here. So it's more likely to spread now in the population of bacteria cells. All right. Any question about that, transposons? Are transposons used in GMOs? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite understand. Are transposons used in genetically modified organisms? They can be used in genetically modified organisms, but usually they are not used. Um, Usually genetically modified organisms are just using transformation where somebody pulls out the gene of interest, they put it into a plasmid, and then they insert that plasmid into a cell. And then this cell could be the genetically modified organism. Uh, for example, this is how human uh, insulin is made now. They took out the gene from a human, put it into a plasmid, and then inserted the plasmid into E. coli, and then got the bacteria to grow up uh, insulin. And then they purify it and then send it to the diabetic patients. Um, I'm trying to think, and I just am not sure where transposons have been used before. Uh, the reason why probably uh, genetic engineers aren't using transposons is 
that if you put the gene of interest onto a transposon, the gene of interest can move around in the genome. And when it moves around, uh, the gene of interest could be turned off or turned on, meaning that when the gene moves around, when the transposon moves around, it can have effects on the genome as well as this gene here. And so that's probably why transposons are not frequently used in uh, genetic engineering. When they create something, they generally want it to be in one place on the chromosome and be stable in that place. And if you put it in a transposon, it's not going to be stable in that one place. It'll move around. Okay? Any other questions about transposons? If not, let's talk about genes and evolution. Uh, all new genetic variation that's seen by a species, if it's brand new, it has to come about by mutation usually spontaneous mutation. But once it exists in a species, it can reassort itself by crossing over, and that really just makes new expression of different genes, so it's just shuffling the genes. But it can move between different cells by transformation conjugation and transduction and it can move around in the genome by transposition and all of these forces can drive evolution so evolution doesn't happen until you have genetic variation that is acted upon by natural selection any questions about that If not, that's it for chapter A. Any questions about genes and genetics? If not, I will uh, do a little bit of review for your quiz too. Hmm. I suppose I should save it. I don't remember any changes I made, except for I took out where we... Uh, had ended last time. So quiz two is covering labs two and labs three. And I actually ask about a large number of questions, about 10 questions on the lab. And then it's also covering chapters four, five, and six. Okay, so chapter eight will not be on quiz two. Chapter eight will be on lab four and it looks like that's all I have for lab I mean uh, excuse me quiz three uh, will be over chapter eight and lab four uh, any questions on any of that okay so let's do a little bit of review for uh, the quiz so let's begin with lab two and then move on to lab three Do you guys see that I'm sh recording this? I am, okay. Yeah. So, lab two is on a septic transfers. You should know how to do a septic techniques because obviously if you were really in a microbiology lab, you'd use this for almost everything you do in the microbiology lab just to keep the culture pure. Um, it helps keep the culture pure. You don't actually require it, meaning you could do it 
non-aseptically and you might be lucky enough that it would work but you'll also use a septic technique when you go into a healthcare facility as your health career so you should know, know a septic technique for that reason if only that reason assuming you're not going to go on to microbiology you should also know the term ubiquitous aseptic technique inoculation contamination and what something is that is sterile now why is that not working there we go so you should know what a pure culture is that's a culture that has only one species in it and you need to work with a pure culture because if you didn't have a pure culture you worked with a culture that had two or more species in it when the microbiological test came positive if you didn't have a pure culture you wouldn't know which organism gave the positive result so you have to work with the pure culture in microbiology and Louis Pasteur is the one who came up with the concept of a pure culture and he even developed a technique for obtaining a pure culture okay however his technique for getting a pure culture was pretty complex and so if you were in the lab you wouldn't want to use his technique for getting a pure culture uh, Dr. Koch came up with a much simpler way for deriving a pure culture and we will talk about his method for getting a pure culture in a later lab you need to use a septic technique or a septic tra transferring in the microbiology lab to minimize the contamination of your cultures a contamination is the accidental inoculation of unwanted organisms into a culture like when you're transferring your culture into a sterile media to grow it in this sterile media a sterile media is something that you're given in the lab that has no microorganisms in it so sterile means it has no living organisms in it and how you get a sterile culture in the lab is uh, usually it's autoclave okay there are other ways you can make it sterile like you could filter sterilize it or you could subject it to radiation killing off all the microbes uh, by using aseptic technique you also reduce the risk of making you sick and other persons in the lab sick because aseptic technique will reduce the chance that you will spread microorganisms in your environment and if you reduce that you will reduce the chance that you'll get sick as well as other people in the lab will get sick all right any question on any of that so when you're using aseptic technique in the lab you should always wipe down the area you're going to work on your workbench space you should wipe it down with disinfectant at the start and at the end you should cover your materials as much as you can like instead of holding this tube it's a liquid so you can't hold it horizontally but you can hold it at a slant if you hold it straight up then something from the air is much more likely to fall into the tube if you hold it at a slant it, something could still fall into it but there's less likelihood like mean things are coming down and so it's going to fall and hit right here if you're holding it at a slant if you had uh, a uh, solid tube you could hold it in a horizontal position and then the chance of something falling into it from the air would be very remote and uh, another thing you can do to keep your uh, culture sterile is leave the lid over the dish when you're working with it with your loop and that way if something falls down from the air it will fall on the lid instead of falling into the culture you should work efficiently and always have the culture covered when not in use and have it uncovered for the shortest time you can 
You should know the terms. Uh, with the tools, you should realize that you can only sterilize the wire portion of the loop. You cannot pour, sterilize the uh, handle portion. Any questions about that? Uh, you should know that you should read the meniscus from the bottom of the liquid that forms the meniscus. And I think that's it for this lab. Oh, you should know about broth cultures. It's a liquid culture as opposed to a solid culture that has something added to the liquid to make it solid. And usually it's auger that's added to make it solid, but it could be gelatin. And then you should know how to label everything you grow in the lab. It should be labeled with your name or your initials, the date, the type of medium it is, and the inoculum, what you are growing in your culture. The incubation temperature is optional. You can state uh, what temperature you're growing it at. All right, any questions about lab two? If not, let's move on to lab three. open? Oh, there it is. So lab three is knowing about the microscope. You should know the learning objectives. Essentially, you should know the different parts of the microscope that are labeled here. And then the different parts are down here. Any question on that? That's a big part of uh, uh, this uh, this lab, knowing the different parts of the microscope. You should also know how to use a microscope, how to take care of a microscope, and how to clean a microscope. I'm not going to ask you everything about this table, but you should know the different objective lenses, meaning what power they are on our scopes, and what the total magnification is. You take the magnification of the objective lens and multiply it by the magnification of the ocular lens. And our scopes have a 10x ocular, so the magnification will always be 10 times the objective lens, the total magnification. You should know the depth of field. You have the biggest or the deepest depth of field for the 4x lens, and as you go up in power, you have a narrower field of view for the objective lens. You should also know the field of view is largest for the 4x objective lens. And as you go up in power with the objective lens, you have a smaller field of view. So that the 4x lens is the easiest one to use, and the 100x lens is the most difficult. Any question about any of that? You should know some of the tips for using a microscope, meaning if something isn't working, what you can do to make the microscope work. You should know how to use the microscope, meaning you should start with the 4X lens. Bring your specimen into focus using the coarse focus lens, and then use fine focus to get it finely focused. and. Uh, Move the specimen into the center of your field of view before you go up to the next higher objective lens. And then repeat that procedure all the way up to the 100x uh, objective lens.
Uh, when you're using the course focus, it should only be used when you're working with the 4x objective lens. After you have your specimen in focus, you should never use the coarse focus. You should only use the fine focus. And that's because our microscopes are parafocal. That means when it is under focus with one lens, it should be under focus with the other lenses, the other objective lenses, or at least very close to being in focus. Any question about any of that? You should know how to put away the microscope. I'm not seeing that in here. I will give you this table if I want to have you know it, so I'm not asking you to memorize this table for how large the field of view are. Uh, you should know that when you're removing oil from the lenses, you should only use lens paper. And that's because lens paper has the wood fibers removed from the paper. All other paper will have wood fibers in it, and wood fibers will scratch the lens. And the lenses are the most expensive part of the microscope. So you should know how to put away a microscope. And I'm not seeing that in here, but I'm pretty sure it's in there. Um, let me see if I can remember. You should take off your slide, lower the stage, bring the 4x lens into place, turn off the light, unplug the microscope, wrap the cord neatly on the the uh, cord holders, and then carry the microscope using two hands and put it in the place where you found it, meaning the, the microscope drawer. And it should go in the same way you had. Generally speaking, the microscope should be put in with the handles and the cord facing out. Uh, of course, before you put it away, if you use oil, you should remove all oil from the microscope and you clean the 100x lens and you should check the 40x lens to see if it has oil because if you rotated the 40x lens around, it will pick up oil from the slide. Any question about any of that? All right, that's it for the labs. Let's go on to chapter four. I don't even know if I have these here. We'll see. Oh, I do. All of them are here. see if this is the right file. Nope, this is only on prokary uh, eukaryotes. Okay, you should know the terms. You should know what a caucus is, a bacillus and a spirilla, the three basic shapes of uh, bacteria. You should know the cellular growth arrangements like uh, Streptococci, Staphylococci, Diplococci. You have cocci growing as a tetrad, cocci growing as a sarcinia. Is there any other cocci? Oh, singlets. You also have singlets cocci, where there's only one single cocci. Bacilli grow as uh, singlets, diplobacilli. Streptobacilli, 
and they can grow as palisades. So instead of streptobacilli where they form a sausage link, they grow as uh, a fence, meaning they're held together on the long side. Uh, the uh, spirilla tend to only be uh, singlets. You should know the other terms like lecocalyx, flagella, axial filaments, fimbriae, villi. These are different parts of a bacteria cell. Peptidoglycan is in the cell wall. It's the major molecule in the cell wall of all bacteria that have a cell wall. You should know what an endotoxin is, and it is lipid A in the gram-negative cells that have a cell wall. And so if you have a bacterial infection and it's a gram-negative, you are always exposed to an endotoxin. And that's generally a bad thing when you're exposed to a toxin. We'll talk about toxins later in the term. You should know about selective permeability and that the cell membrane is selectively permeable, allowing some things to enter and allowing, not allowing other things to enter. You should know what diffusion is, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and what act of transport is. So of all of these ways for something to move into the cell, they will happen without the expenditure of energy with diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. But if it moves into the cell by act of transport, the cell is spending energy to move that molecule into the cell. And it will get the energy from one molecule of ATP. Any question about that? You should know what tonicity is and plasmids. And I think we just talked about plasmids today. Apparently we did talk about it briefly earlier. You should know what an inclusion is. That's something that the cell is uh, incorporating inside the cell. And as it builds up in materials, it will precipitate out of the cell and then form an inclusion inside the cytoplasm of the cell. You should also know what an endospore is and the endosymbiotic theory. And this has to do with not endospores, but with uh, how eukaryotic cells may have obtained their mitochondria and chloroplast. And it's a theory for how they ob obtain those organelles. You should know how the gram-positive cell wall is different from a gram-negative cell wall and then describe the importance of taxis in bacteria. So you should know generally how a prokaryotic cell differs from a eukaryotic cell and that is it has a no nucleus and no organelles. And eukaryotes have those. Prokaryotes also differ in that they're about one-tenth the size a eukaryotic cell. We already talked about those. Uh, we didn't really talk about that, but I don't think I'm going to ask you any question about unusual bacteria shapes. You probably shouldn't know what pleomorphic is, but I don't ask you about that on the quiz either. Uh, I do ask you about cellular growth arrangements, and we've already gone over that. And the bacilli have fewer growth arrangements than the cocci. Any question about that? And there's the palisade. If you uh, rotate that 90 degrees, you'll have your fence. And that's why they call it a palisade. All right. Any question about any of this? I'm trying to move quickly through it. Uh, you should know the different structures of the prokaryotic cell, and you should know that three structures are found on all cells. All cells have a cytoplasm, all cells have a plasma membrane, and all cells have DNA. You could say that all cells also have ribosomes, but the ribosomes of a prokaryote are smaller, they're 70S, than the ribosomes of a eukaryote, they're larger, they're 80S. You should know what a glycocalyx is, and that if you see it 
under a microscope, we call it a capsule. Any questions about any of that? You should know what a flagella is and that if a bacteria cell, or actually any prokaryotic cell, moves and swims, it's doing so because it has flagella. Any questions about that? You should know that what taxis is, movement toward or away from a stimuli, and that there's two tax, uh, taxi, I guess would be the word. There's chemotaxis and then phototaxis. We talked about uh, flagella. Well, there's an endoflagella, and it's only found on spirochetes. It is a flagella that is wrapped around the cell. Let me blow this up a little bit. It's wrapped around the cell, and it's inside the cell wall. So the endoflagella, or axial filaments, are actually inside the cell wall. And when the flagella moves, it gives the bacteria a characteristic corkscrew-like movement. Come on, let's end this. Any question about endoflagella? You should know what a frimbria is that allows the bacteria to attach to something, and it's just hair-like structures from a, a bacteria cell. Uh, the sex pili, we talked about that today. It's the structure that allows conjugation to happen, and to this cell, the F plus cell, has an F-plasmid in it that codes for the construction of the X sex pillus, and uh, it literally skewers an F-minus cell. And then it is hollow, so it will allow a, a plasmid to move from this cell into that cell in a process that we call conjugation. As you know, the prokaryotic cell wall and the cell wall protects the cell from osmotic lysis. If the cell did not have a cell wall and was not in an osmotically neutral environment, if the cell did not have a cell wall and there's more water outside the cell than inside the cell, which is normally the environment that most bacteria find themselves in, then water would move into the cell. And that would happen until the cell membrane expanded so much that it burst and that would kill the cell. If the cell has a cell wall, the cell wall will prevent the cell membrane from expanding any further than the cell wall. The cell wall, of course, is mostly made up of peptidoglycan, and there's two types. I guess you should know that peptidoglycan is two disaccharides, nag and niom, just repeating in a row. Uh, that's a covalent bond in that row, but uh, each row is held together by uh, short polypeptides that link this row to that row and that row to that row, the next row down. And that's why we call it peptidoglycan. It has peptides and glycans, the two sugars and egg and nam. Um, you should know that the gram-positive cell wall is thick, has many layers of peptidoglycan. It also has tocoic acid in it. And that's the gram-positive cell wall. The gram-negative cell wall also has peptidoglycan. It's not as thick. It has more than one layer. It's showing you one layer of peptidoglycan, but it's more than one layer. It's just a thinner layer than the gram-positive cells. Uh, the gram-negative cells also have an outer membrane, which is lipid-rich. Let's look at this slide here. 
and uh, the lower layer is all lipid A. I mean, it's not all. It has proteins in it and carbohydrates, but it's mainly the lipid is lipid A. The upper bilayer of the gram-negative outer membrane uh, does have lipid A in it, but also, excuse me, does have phospholipids in it, but it also has lipid A in it, and lipid A is an endotoxin. Lipid A is hooked to the O polysaccharide, and so together lipid A is in a lipopolysaccharide. That's that blue molecule there. Lipid A is the important part of the gram-negative outer membrane or gram-negative cells because lipid A is an endotoxin. Any question about any of that? Uh, there are porin molecules in the outer membrane of a gram-negative cell, and the function of the porin proteins is to allow molecules to come across the outer membrane and then enter the cell if the cell wants them. Or if the cell is getting rid of molecules, the porin protein allows that waste molecule to leave the outer membrane. We talked about that. I'm not going to ask you any questions about uh, eukaryotic cells in quiz two. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Actually, I'm actually wrong place anyways. This is gram positive versus gram negative. You should know how the gram positive cell walls differ from a gram negative cell wall. You should also know that the gram or the cell wall, whether it's gram positive or gram negative, the differences apply to the gram stain and how the gram stain stains the cell. That the crystal violet iodine complexes gets stuck in the cell wall, the peptidoglycan of the gram positive cells, and it washes out of the peptidoglycan of the gram negative cells. Any question about any of them? I don't think I'm asking any questions about atypical cells. We'll talk about mycoplasmums later in the term, and we'll talk about mycobacterium in one of the later labs. I don't think you've done the lab yet where you're staying for mycobacterium, did you? I don't think we have. Yeah, I don't think you have yet either. I think it's in a future lab. So I haven't asked any questions about that. That I remember. Didn't ask anything about that. Uh, Gram-negative cells are important because that outer membrane can help protect the cell. Like when you're exposing the cells to penicillin G, penicillin G cannot get through the outer membrane of a gram-negative cell. So penicillin G does not work on their cells, on gram-negative cells. Plasma membrane, you should know that we follow the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane, and that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable, allowing other certain molecules to cross and preventing other molecules from crossing. The two molecules you need to know that cross the cell membrane or the plasma membrane are oxygen and carbon dioxide, and they cross the cell membrane by diffusion. Lipids also do, but you don't really need to know about that. I didn't ask any questions about that. Uh, other molecules, if they want to cross the cell membrane, there has to be a protein in the membrane, like a transport protein, to get the cell to uh, allow it, the molecule to enter the cell or leave the cell if we're trying to get rid of a waste product. Any question about that? I don't think I asked you about uh, uh, chromatophores. 
Where is that one? Oh, I, I might have asked you a question about uh, the cell membrane. How's the enzymes for making ATP? And we'll talk about that. Actually, we've talked about that. Aerobic respiration, we've talked about that. So things can cross the cell membrane by a passive process or an active process. Trying to move quickly through this. Uh, you should know about active transport, moving something into the cell with an active transport protein, which uses ATP. You should know about group translocation, a special form of active transport that's only found in prokaryotes. And what that does is uh, a molecule will be moving into the cell in an active transport protein, so it'll spend ATP to move the molecule into the cell. But that molecule is chemically altered once it is moved into the cell. And like if you're moving in glucose into the cell through group translocation, you will attach a phosphate group to that glucose molecule. So instead of having glucose, you'll have a glucose phosphate molecule. Okay? Any question about group translocation? Uh, you should know that the ribosomes of prokaryotic cells are smaller, 70S, than the ribosomes of eukaryotic cells, and they're 80S. You should just know that inclusions can happen in cells. You should know about endospores, and that generally they're made by two families of bacteria, Bacillus and Clostridium and that endospores are not a reproductive structure, they're a survival structure. And the endospore is something that uh, can survive most environments. So environments that become harsh to the parent cell, the endospore can survive that harsh environment. And endospores are the form of life that is the most difficult thing to kill. And then you should know the endosymbiotic theory. All right, any questions about this chapter? If not, we're past our time, aren't we? Oh, we have 15 minutes to go, I think. Let me look on here. Does it go to 3.30? I think it's 3.45. 3.45. Oh, then we got lots of time. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next chapter. Chapter five, we've still got two more chapters to go, so it's a good thing we have a lot of time. You should know the terms of microbial metabolism, with catabolism, anabolism, and uh, R, and that together they make metabolism. Catabolism is the uh, breaking down of a larger molecule into smaller molecules, Anabolism is the building up of small molecules to make a larger molecule. And reactions proceed because of the activation energy of the reaction. And in cells, reactions happen because an enzyme is, is uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, making the reaction proceed. You can have different types of reaction and you can have different ways of preventing it, such as competitive inhi inhibition and non-competitive or allosteric inhibition. Uh, you should know what redox reactions are. Those are oxidation reduction reactions. You should know what the different trophs are, photoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, chemoautotrophs, and chemoheterotrophs. And then lastly, you should know what aerobic respiration is, its steps, and how it differs from anaerobic respiration and from fermentation. And you should know that cells can make ATP, 
from all of these methods, aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, or fermentation. They can also make ATP from photosynthesis. And there's two types of photosynthesis, cyclic photosynthesis, which only makes ATP, and non-cyclic photosynthesis, which we didn't talk about. It makes ATP, but the ATP is used to make glucose. And you should know what feedback inhibition is. Isn't non-cyclic respiration the one where that occurs during uh, the nighttime when there's no light? Are you talking about plants? The photosynthesis, yeah. Yeah, in the night when plants have no light, if they need energy, they will get the energy they need from aerobic respiration. So during the night, a plant will get its energy needs from aerobic respiration. And in the winter in Point Barrow, Alaska, which has a night for three months, the plant will get its energy needs from aerobic respiration. But in the daytime, plants will get their energy need from uh, cyclic photosynthesis. All right, you should know a metabolic pathway. You just take a uh, one reaction and connect it to the next, connect it to the next, and then we have a metabolic pathway. You should know the collision theory for chemical reaction, and that is chemical reactions may occur when atoms, ions, and molecules collide with each other with enough energy to, uh, or, or what do you call that, uh, with enough energy to undergo the activation energy, the energy needed to disrupt the electronic configurations in the reactants to make the product. So when you're changing the reactant to the product, you have to go over an energy hump, and the energy hump is greater without the enzyme than when it is with an enzyme. And for example, if I had a beaker of glucose, I could convert it into CO2 and water by taking a blowtorch to the glucose and then burning it, and that would release a large amount of energy because you have to have a very high temperature to get the energy of activation without the enzyme. But that happens all the time in our cells with an enzyme. And so that's showing you that the activation energy with an enzyme is much less than the activation energy without an enzyme. Any question about that? You should know that enzymes are biological catalysts and they essentially speed up a chemical reaction. And enzymes are encoded by genes. Uh, what happens is, let's see if I've got a picture of that. Enzymes form a uh, complex with the substrate and so that the enzyme, for our purposes, we're saying the active site which binds to the enzyme only binds, excuse me, the active site of the enzyme binds to one and only one substrate. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's okay for this class. Okay? So one substrate binds to one active site of one enzyme. And the enzyme binds to the substrate, meaning one-to-one, -one, like the lock and the key model, or by the hand-in-the-glove model, meaning that the enzyme changes its shape to fit or mold to the, the substrate. And actually, the substrate also slightly changes its shape as stress is put on the, the uh, chemical bonds of the substrate. And that's what converts the substrate into the product. You should know the different factors that can influence the activity of an enzyme. And that tends to denature the protein if you uh, 
and activate the enzyme. You can also have an inhibitor and activate an enzyme. A competitive inhibitor is one that actually binds to the active site of the enzyme. So it's competing with the substrate for binding. A non-competitive or allosteric inhibitor is one that binds at a site other than the active site to inhibit the enzyme. And what the allosteric inhibitor or non-competitive inhibitor does when it binds to the enzyme, it makes the protein change its folding pattern and that changes the shape of the active site so it can no longer bind to the substrate. You should know that feedback inhibition is a simple way that a cell can regulate its contents and what happens is when the cell is making a product, let me see if I can blow that up just a little bit, starting from one substrate made into several intermediates and then makes the end product, the end product can then go back and bind to an enzyme of this enzymatic reaction pathway and inhibit the enzyme and now that enzyme can no longer function and so no more intermediates are made and then no more end product will be made and that is feedback inhibition. It's often seen in cells because when an enzyme is making an end product, when you get enough of that end product, you don't need more so you can shut down the enzyme and then that shuts down the formation of making further end product. Any question about that? I don't think I ask you anything about ribozymes. Those are RNA enzymes. You should know about the that all living things have an energy source and a carbon source, and they require an energy source and a carbon source, and that you can classify things for where they're getting their energy. Phototrophs derive their energy from light. Chemotrophs derive their energy from chemicals. And then you can classify things by where they get their carbon source from. An autotroph is something that gets its principal carbon from CO2. A heterotroph gets its carbon from an organic chemical carbon source like glucose. And you can combine those and so you should know what a photoautotroph is and a photoheterotroph, a chemoautotroph and a chemoheterotroph. So I do ask you at least one question about an organism and it's getting its light source from something and its carbon source from something and then I ask you, what of these is it? Any question about that? Uh, cells make ATP because ATP is the energy carrier of cells. And uh, generally they make ATP by using a, a number of oxidation reduction reactions. That's a redox reaction. And how you can remember that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. You say Leo, Leo lose electrons oxidation. The lion goes Ger, Ger gain electrons reduction. Aerobic respiration is the conversion of the energy in glucose to the energy in ATP and along the way energy is lost as heat by cellular respiration and the glucose and the oxygen are converted into carbon dioxide and water. So look, here is a summary reaction for all of the steps in aerobic respiration where glucose, C6, H12O6, and six, uh, six oxygen molecules 
with 38 ADP and 38 inorganic phosphates make six CO2 molecules, six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and 38 ATP molecules. Now, this is all the chemical and the physical steps, a summary of all the chemical and the physical steps for aerobic respiration. It happens in a large number of steps. And it doesn't happen all at once. Cells have generally three mechanisms for making ATP. Uh, they can make ATP by substrate level phosphorylation, by respiration, uh, which we see in the electron transport chain of, of uh, aerobic respiration, and in photophosphorylation. Those are the three ways that a cell can generate ATP. Uh, one way that many cells generate ATP is by metabolizing carbohydrates. Glucose is the most common energy source, but as we discussed at the end of this lesson, the cells can use lipids and proteins and other carbohydrates for generating their ATP from aerobic respiration or some other means. We will talk about aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration fermentation with using glucose. Okay? There are two general ways that cells can engage in carbohydrate carb metabolism to generate ATP. One is with respiration, and that can be broken down into aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. And cells can also use fermentation to generate ATP from glucose. Uh, you should know that glycolysis of aerobic respiration happens in the cytoplasm. It does generate some ATP, 2 ATP per molecule of glucose, and then pyruvate is generated. Some of the electrons from glucose are carried by NADH, which I'll talk about NADH in a little bit. Uh, pyruvate cannot enter the Krebs cycle directly but the pyruvate moves into the mitochondria of eukaryotic cells and this happens in the cytoplasm of prokaryotic cells where the Krebs cycle happens and the pyruvate cannot join the Krebs cycle directly it has to um, be switched by the oh I haven't talked about glu glycolysis yet um, well, we'll skip it, because we're just going to talk about the overview. In glycolysis, glucose is created to pyruvate, which is converted by the preparatory step into uh, acetyl coenzyme A, which can then join the Krebs cycle. Okay? In the Krebs cycle, we do generate 2 ATP per molecule of glucose, but you generate a lot of NADH and FADH2, and that gets together with the NADH coming from glycolysis. And these molecules carry electrons to the electron transport chain. And that has a number of names. Uh, the electron transport chain happens in eukaryotes in the inner mitochondrial membrane. In prokaryotes, the electron transport chain happens in the cell membrane. Any question about any of that? All right, let's talk just a little bit about aerobic respiration. Mm. Trying to blow that up a little bit. Uh, in the electron transport chain, the electrons are brought by NADH and FADH2 to proteins in a membrane. And that's why it's called the electron transport chain. 
It's a chain of proteins in the membrane. And the electrons move from one protein in the membrane to the next protein in the membrane. And while the electrons are moving through some of the proteins, this one, that one, and that one, they give the protein the energy it needs to move hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. The electrons then flow to oxygen in aerobic respiration, which combines with electrons and hydrogen to make water. And this is why we have to breathe so that in aerobic respiration we can make water. The hydrogen ions are built up on this side of the membrane and this potential energy difference is used to make ATP. As the hydrogen ions move across the membrane they do so with this protein which is an ATP synthase protein and as the hydrogen ions give the protein the energy it needs to combine phosphate with ADP to make ATP. Any questions about that? So in prokaryotes the electron transport chain makes 34 ATP molecule per molecule of glucose. In eukaryotes it's either 32 or 34 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. And we say the final electron acceptor in uh, aerobic respiration is oxygen because oxygen is the last molecule to accept the electrons that were flowing originally from glucose. Any question about that? Time. Yeah. Oh, it's time. It's time to go. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see if there's anything really important. Yeah, there is one thing that's really important. Let's briefly talk about photosynthesis. You can leave if you want. Uh, photosynthesis is the conversion of light energy into chemical energy in glucose. And there are two photosynthetic reactions, cyclic photosynthesis and non-cyclic photosynthesis. Non-cyclic photosynthesis does make ATP, but the ATP is used to make glucose, and you only need to know the one making oxygen. And so if the cell wants glucose, it'll engage in non-cyclic photosynthesis. But if the cell wants ATP, it'll engage in cyclic photosynthesis. Cyclic photosynthesis, light strikes the electrons in chlorophyll. The electrons then move through different proteins in a transport chain of proteins in the membrane. And this is in the cell membrane of prokaryote cells. It's in the chloroplast of uh, plant cells. And uh, as the electrons move through this protein, they give the protein the energy it needs to pump hydrogen ions to this side of the membrane. And then the hydrogen ions flow through this protein because they want to move from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. And this protein will use the energy of the hydrogen ion to make ATP. All right, any question about any of that? Did you go back one slide? Yeah. Sorry, oh, I just mind. shut it down. Let me bring it up here. It's near the end. This one? Or the previous one? Yes, the previous one. Okay. Perfect. I just needed to get the last of that equation. Okay. All right. Also study chapter six for the quiz. And if there's no further questions. Oh, got it. Thank you. We're done.
Um, I have a question. I don't know if you got my email about the um, download for the quiz. 